Thank you once again to all those who joined us. I'll start with the short remarks about why we decided to conduct this survey, about a few words about the background, the context, and why we think it's important. Hopefully not only for us. Why so much interest to, to this towards this topic? We all know that the role of digital tools in 2020 grew up exponentially. We're not talking about social feeds alone, only political communication uh, that very often is present during the electoral campaign and uh, protest in many countries. We are talking about the new digital tools that have uh, become numerous uh, in Belarus, such as application for voting, mobilization uh, through the uh, messengers like Telegram, various chatbots and other digital tools that have already widened the arsenal of digital um, tools used during the electoral campaign. While in 2020, the digitalization was aimed at create, creating not only the safe platform, but also mobilization. Currently, the digital platforms are the only way to openly and safely communicate in the country between Belarusians. And of course, they are no longer as powerful and as important as they were in 2020, in the sense that to mobilize citizens in 20 now uh, using digital tools is much more difficult for a number of reasons, we all know. Uh, first and foremost, due to the repressions on the side of the state. Also, in the last several years, the Belarusian regime have been narrowing the digital space uh, legally or through chaotic implementation of already existing digital measures. Also, through uh, separate repressions that are not limited to any legislation or rhetoric. After 2020, we noticed that the Belarusian regime have been actively using digital platforms, uh, various digital platforms, including the YouTube and many others that have not been touched in this survey. We decided to explore two of those. Hence, we can uh, conclude that methodology of this survey is uh, based on quality. It's um, explorative. We aim to understand the trends, to understand what we can touch, to understand how it will work in the future. So we decided to focus on two platforms like Telegram, which has become a rel relatively new platform for pro-regime speakers after 2020 protest. So the regime gradually entered the platform that used to be popular uh, among the democratic forces and oppositions, opposition activists, and the main forum uh, for and strategies by this used by the regime are discreditation, harassment, uh, spreading the pro-governmental narratives. It all testifies to the widening the political field for the communication, which can be seen if we look at the social feeds and the messengers over the last several years. Let's move on. Considering all of the above, we uh, had several interests uh, in this inter survey. First and foremost, well, if the future, what is the future of the political initiatives? What are the advantages of the digital communication and politics? How is digital space of Belarus limited? And also wanted to explore what kinds of communication, kinds of communication and narratives uh, are present in the Telegram and TikTok. Let's move on now. What is this survey and research about? Short. It has four parts. The first part answers the question how civil and political projects online operate, what is their future? Here we talk about the words of experts initiative. The second part focuses on exploring the opinions of democratic Belarusians, trying to understand how they see the future of these projects and their contribution into the political changes in Belarus. We would also like to know what are the limitations posed by the Belarusian legislation in the digital space. And the last but not least, uh, the monitoring of the explorative monitoring of the social networks like Telegram and TikTok, these two platforms. We wanted to understand what are the main political narratives and forms of presenting content can be seen 
at those platforms. In order to conduct this research, all four parts of it, we conduct interviews with 12 political analysts, experts, etc. We analyzed uh, the people who created these platforms and who can critically evaluate them thanks to their expertise. We uh, surveyed project critics Belarusians in Belarus using this platform. Also, we conduct the qualitative review of the Belarusian legislation. And in the last part, we monitored for 12 weeks the TikTok and Telegram. First part is about opinion of the digital, digital initiatives, experts and analysts. It is clear that while reading this research, you'll find many more opinions and uh, th uh, thoughts that can be highlighted, but I, I am focused on the four of them first, and almost all initiatives position themselves as non-political, but uh, civil initiatives, all the digital initiatives that we understand uh, by the projects that use digital tools like crowdfunding, social feeds, chatbots to activate people. The examples here are like the by soul, honest people, cyber partisans, etc. So it's not only about the initiatives who have their goal uh, to change the political situation. These initiatives that want to engage Belarusians for certain actions or for certain online activities. Representatives of these initiatives do not call themselves political, don't think they fulfill any political goals, but there were two initiatives among the, those that we surveyed that clearly articulate their political ambitions. First and foremost, it's the initiative called Cyber Partisans that uh, say that the uh, solution of the number one and for them will be the bring Topol Lukashenko. So they have a narrow understanding of the politics as the uh, simple act, direct action. Only two of such issues. Others call themselves uh, civil projects or educational projects that want to activate or engage citizens of Belarus or those uh, representatives of the diaspora. The second thesis is uh, that uh, even though experts said that none of the projects were mentioned are uh, considered political, uh, including cyber partisans who have this vivid uh, political ambitions. Experts believe that coordinating council has a potential and uh, believe that if it has a certain service or system that uh, would allow to understand all the initiatives uh, and thoughts of the members of the council, who joins whom and so on. That would be an interesting tool. This position was mentioned by many experts and they um, mentioned the coordination council as an example of a project that could be called digital and at the same time political. On the whole, the digital projects reflect uh, the uh, demand of the society and a certain bridge between Belarusians in the immigration and Belarusians inside the country. The idea is that the digital initiatives believe that currently, while we don't have direct influence on the situation in Belarus, Belarusians abroad can practice their skills and try to acquire new skills and knowledge that in future could be used to set up civil and political activity in, in life in Belarus. It's very important that Christopher mentioned at the beginning that projects do not survive without a value base, without a, a central concept and basic ideas that are the foundation of those projects. Almost all of the experts that we surveyed mentioned that all these um, projects separately cannot influence the uh, regime without, uh, can replace the authorities 
replace the effect of political actions. We all agree on this. This uh, idea is uh, seems to be natural, but the experts do have the, this this thought. I'm uh, saying that while today democratic forces work in with digital tools and digital platforms, such platforms can be used to promote certain values to help develop activities offline. That could also, among other things, be used by everyone. So experts notes that we are not entering a new era of brands, concentrating the many initiatives of now official status of being extremists. It's very important to achieve certain goals by building the niche and partisan projects and have influence uh, agents and influences inside the country. I just believe it's important to of put meaning into all the civil and online initiatives. The second part is about the survey of pro-democratic Belarusians. Narodne Aparos, the organizations helped us to conduct this survey. There were 1,200 people, 95 of them were in Belarus. You'll read more about this in the research, which has a detailed overview. The main thing here is that it's the audience that is loyal to democratic forces starting from 2020, which supports any initiative connected with the democratic changes in Belarus. 95% of the audience um, is inside Belarus. We we'll ask them questions about how they see the activities of digital projects. Yeah, on the screen you can see the graph uh, showing that um, quite a big support is seen in the initiatives called cyber partisans by Seoul, by Paul, a little bit less uh, in the moment of the majority. And uh, app New Belarus, we asked people what uh, were the initiatives that they took part in. We see that quite a significant people would like to not share this information, didn't want to share this information. Quite a few people. There was a correlation between the initiatives like cyber partisans, the reverse correlation, meaning that the people think their activities are very useful, but at the same time, very few people actually took part in the, the operation of such initiatives, only 5%. The same is true about BIPOL, but overall, there are certain initiatives that Belarusians did not mark as the useful, like uh, Human Rights Center, SNA, but 10% of the people who served it are actually taking part in their operation and activities. Also, we ask people to react to certain statements connected with uh, how uh, they could evaluate the role of the digital technologies in uh, solving democratic tasks. The two main statements here, positive and negative, 70% of the people who served it agreed with the statement that digital platforms are a very good tool in order to Established connection between the Belarusians that have left the country, those still living in it. Um, judging from a different angles, almost uh, half, a bit more than half of the surveyed people believe that democratic forces use the maximum amount of the digital tools and the online communication is the safest form of their activity. Over 40% claim that democratic forces should think of how should they act offline, what other forms of uh, guerrilla actions or volunteer projects can be uh, implemented. The majority are saying that the Belarusian policy, democratic policy, it has nothing to do with reality. 
the last two opinions reflect the views of the experts. Overall, as uh, one of the latest questions shows, it is the question whether digital projects can influence the situation in the country, and we can see that half of the survey believe that there is certain influence. They uh, can influence it, or probably can, a little less. About a third of the survey believe that such changes are possible thanks to the digital initiatives. It's also very important to know that one fifth of the respondents didn't have any opinion on this. Let's move to the fourth part of our survey. I'm uh, omitting the third part, but you'll be able to read about it in the text of the survey. I'll tell you more about the monitoring narratives of uh, pro-democratic and pro-regime speakers. The aim of this monitoring was to understand what are the political narratives and strategies are used by pro-democratic and pro-regime speakers. What are the forms of the content that prevail in this? And uh, we are guided by the, mm, our desire to select the most qualitative, high quality channels and accounts. We have selected 35 pro-regime telegram channels and 35 pro-democratic ones. 35 pro-regime uh, TikTok accounts and uh, 26 pro-democratic TikTok accounts, as well as 50 TikTok hashtags. And the survey reflects it that uh, a big amount of content in the TikTok is spread not by the channels, concrete channels, but individual accounts. They can be seen from outside as the accounts that have nothing to do with politics. At the same time, they do have from time to time certain videos in support of Lukashenko or in support of democratic forces. So they can be seen as individual producers of content or collective producers, but non-political ones. At the same time, this sample, every channel and every hashtag can be uh, seen by you in the application, in the addendum to the our survey. Let's move to the main narratives. On the one hand, it is quite obvious. On the other hand, it's quite interesting to see uh, that even it is those narratives that were foundational founding. We notice them every week. During the 12 weeks, we were watching how they were developing. And we, there were some narratives uh, that were changing for democratic speakers, democratic forces, and their own messages that were published in TikTok and in Telegram. So, the, in other words, the focus on the economy, there was explanation why it was getting worse, how Lukashenko is to blame. And the big, another big narrative is that Belarus supports Ukraine. At the same time, Russia is the political, historical uh, enemy of Belarus. Also, uh, there was an active narrative that b the future of Belarus is in Europe, that the West supports Belarusians, and Belarusians need uh, healthy nationalism. Also had to do with the reactions that pro regimes, regime speakers, they conducted the active policies against white, red, white flag. And it was in that period that we noticed the big that movement against Belarusian Latin alphabet and the Belarusian and Polish cemeteries. The democratic forces in response said we need to protect ours, Belarusian things and uh, values, and also the the grown dem demograph demographic of mm, repression was also mentioned. More and more that more and more people are found, find themselves in prison. And the main narrative was that Lukashenko is to blame for what is happening in Belarus. He's not the guarantor of stability, uh, rather a uh, mm, war criminal. These are the main narratives that, that you'll be able to find in the main text 
the, in detail, we describe all the narratives that we mentioned. Among the pro-regime channels and accounts, we have domination of the ideological narratives. The, there were a lot of videos and statements about white red white flag, claiming that the well, it is not ours, it's the Nazi-related flag that uh, should be destroyed, uh, including the Belarusian uh, Latin alphabet, and then white red white proponents should be destroyed and in prison. Their position is in split, is split, the nuclear weapons uh, strengthen the position of Belarus, of course. Here, the location is the grant of stability and independence and sovereignty. At the same time, the Western countries are in crisis and uh, dragging uh, down the Ukraine and manipulating them. Russia is uh, our partner and uh, elder brother, and together we'll move through all the sanctions and war. All these narratives can be uh, described in more detail, but they can uh, can be called uh, the foundational here, just for to understand. It's important to note also another point that the narrative uh, about uh, Western countries being in crisis was about the uh, description of internal activities in France, Poland, Lithuania. There was reaction to them showing that not everything is great there. And that's why Belarus is not the worst country there is. Because in the West, things are much worse because the values there are bad and, uh, and different and they do not coincide with others. This is the context of such narratives. Again, all this has to do with the forms of the content but before that, we'll tell you a little bit more about the strategies. What can be said in general about such narratives? At first, for both camps that we analyzed, we found the strategy of discredit discrediting the political opponent. In other words, they were trying to say as many bad words about the opponent as possible. Here they select the central figures like Lukashenko and Tikhanovsky and the smallest one and uh, small conflicts and so on. But the main locomotive of such movement is to discredit their opponent. There are also ideological narratives. An important line here is about monitoring that we found that many all these two camps were uh, talking about the sources and the foundations of our state, the GDL, like Grand Duchy of Lithuania or the Soviet Union. Too much and too many, too much or too little of Belarusian. The role of the Soviet Union, the attitude to Russian and the Western culture in the pro-regime channels. We were surprised by the fact that we saw so this is something that we should think about in the future. We saw the topic of religion being actually discussed in the pro-regime channels, like Christianity in general and uh, Orthodox Church and upbringing using the religious environment. That was uh, unexpected for us. Clearly, the war in Ukraine was the main um, event used by the narratives. Anything that can be tied to Ukraine was tied to Ukraine in both political camps. It was also tied to the mutiny by Prigozhin, the beginning of the counteroffensive of Ukraine, and similar events. Another line that can be used to track the difference in narratives is the strategic alliance and partnership. Are we friends with the West or the East? Who should we look towards? The Pertum Critic speakers were obviously 
moving towards and orienting themselves toward the West and pro-regime ones were looking at Russia and East, the East in general. It's uh, noteworthy that the role of leader were described in a totally different way. We see that the pro-regime speakers Lukashenko has a significant weight. He's positioned by the grant of sovereignty. All the successes, all the achievements in the country, they are connected with Lukashenko. While well, Tikhanovsky at the same time represents the people and she is seen uh, through the narrative that we all have achieved something, we are one all in a not a great situation. So here the personalistic attitude to Lukashenko and more collective attitude to the figure of Tikhanovska. This will be one of the last slides. We also examined the format of the content in Telegram and TikTok. What are the conclusions that could be made? Not only just the formats, but certain aspects connected with the posting Telegram and TikTok. We noticed that in Telegram, very often the Persian channels are blocked. In TikTok, at the same time, we have a domination of a, the deletion of the content, the comment the re reaction to political opponents. We don't know what it is. Connected with the uh, certain claims, but there was certain share of content, uh, and TikTok is deleted and going to the same links and same hashtags. We no longer see the same publications in Telegram. We see the news and uh, analytical statements. While in TikTok, the format is different. This has to do with the structure of the platform and the algorithm. So there we uh, see very historical uh, narratives, in the news of the day, investigations. So, but there could be a lot of videos from 2020. In Telegram, we noticed a networking, a spreading of the content. From time to time, we may seem that the certain narratives of certain publications are seen in at the same time in many channels, not only pro-regime ones, but also in pro-democratic ones. I have a feeling that certain media centers that are spreading these uh, these narratives in TikTok. There were a lot of popular hashtags. The majority of, of them were per regime ones, uh, in favor of Lukashenko and in favor of Batka. They received plus 500 millions of views. So within three months, one of these hashtags received 500 millions of views more. When we talk about these two platforms, we talk about different coverage and totally different figures, much fewer in uh, Telegram. In TikTok, those are millions and trillions. In Telegram, very often we see the predominance of pro-regime speakers. Like I mentioned, uh, we describe what has happened in other countries and TikTok, it's both down to algorithms, but uh, there are more reaction of the audience to the publication. There are lots of commentaries, a lot of reposts, duets, and so on. It's an interesting point here at the end of my presentation. Democratic forces have a lot of old videos. How democratic resistance was building what Belarusians were going through and the information that 2020 was not the first year of protest. 
historical narratives and so on. While Persian TikToks has a lot of personalistic videos, one of the interesting points here is Lukashenko, Lukashenko became the new crush of the this TikTok, there are a lot of TikTok videos that romanticize him, his figure, personality, through filters, certain shots where he's portrayed in, an, in a certain way. Apparently, people think that it, those shots are uh, pretty. Uh, people who analyze this from the quality point of view noted this as the Romantiz romantization of certain Persian figures. There's a lot of conclusions. The main ones, uh, overall, we can say that those in democratic resistance online is uh, multi-faceted. It has both civil uh, initiatives and those with different ambitions. It has not only competencies, but also the vision how to implement such digital project that has the audience inside the country that believes in its success. At the same time, political situation demands not only collective digital solutions, but also concepts and ideas that will allow the initiative to find the new ways to unite online and offline platforms. Either a political and other or other projects. I stop here. Please ask your questions. I'd like to give floor to Natalia. Thank you, Lacey, for this work. We have several questions from those in the chat and those who registered. I know that you also invited Artem Schreiber and Andrew Sushko to comment on certain parts of your uh, survey. I think we should start with them. I ask Andrei how uh, initiatives from civil uh, can be used as a potential. Andrei Sushko, who is a lawyer in the... I would like to thank to thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this research, for this overview of the digitalization and the situation on the whole of various facets, because I am involved in digitalization issues. And I see it as the what is happening inside and outside organizations. On the one hand, on the other hand, the communication with the audience. Thank you uh, for this. It's a very interesting survey and research to discuss and develop it furthermore. I was asked to to answer certain questions. So feel free to write your questions in the chat. I would like to talk about how digital instruments are not used enough. The potential is not used here. And what are the points of growth? I agree that we had not only unexpected events from a political point of view, but we call it civic tech instruments and tools of the civil society. It was a, a wave of instruments that at the time reflected and could answer the question 
те запросы, которые были uh, после протеста, the, во время протеста, demands that were during the protest, after the protest. Сейчас же мы видим, что, к сожалению, наверное, большинство, подавляющее большинство... Unfortunately, we see now the majority of such initiatives. Или перестали работать, или... Either stop working, or are no longer relevant. And there's a downfall of the activity of the civil society. Also, among other things, it's happening, it's happening because there's a certain slowing down. Because the state, as the opponent of the civil society, has disappeared. Why? Because because the effective mechanism of influence on, on the decision-making process are no longer there. We see a uh, few people who sign the petitions, who tend to state bodies, because people don't believe that it's possible to change something. Who are they afraid to do this? That's why now we have the most effective the most effective mechanism of collecting money to support political prisoners. And it's the easiest way of involving people in the civil activity. Just do it financially, with the financial means. Now, a few more words about digitalization. I'm not going to talk about the political actors. You had it in your research. The situation that we have now, I don't see any big activity to recruit proponents. Because all of this were either arrested or activists were arrested or ex expelled from Europe, from Belarus. So uh, talking about this is uh, how digitalization is affected in the context. If we talk about uh, NGOs, non-commercial projects and some uh, communities, I see I don't want to criticize uh, this, but I think the potential of on the background of what is happening, what happened in 2020, the potential of using digital tools inside the country to set up projects inside the, the country to analyze data and not use them. To the full. Just like external tools to organize communication. So uh, there are classical media tools, like you mentioned, like TikTok, Telegram, others, but uh, there are no revolutionary tools for communication that we've seen and those in NGOs and those in community are not using any of the new tools and approaches. You also mentioned, I wrote it down, the coordinating council has the potential 
object for or actor for digitalization. And I think here. Yeah, Uh, it's interesting to understand how in the nearest election, how uh, the election will be organized and how in the media sense. It's an important attempt to involve people into democratic processes. While there's no possibility to influence the state, it's possible to try and to practice it with other structures. I'll talk now about the potential points of growth. Recently, I've been actively working with the team of a new Belarus, Pavel Liber, and we're trying to we're trying to create instruments and while the interest of the civil society it was uh, civil society is on the downfall we're trying to create a, a structure of occupation between those and those inside the country and outside the country there's a big potential uh, of joining the interest of people inside the country and outside the country to create uh, the tools of reaction to decision making on the one hand and uh, It is only possible to formulate certain agenda for such structures and to propose certain steps. In the nearest future, we're launching the feedback instruments for democratic structures. Now we're launching the instrument to create communities for people so that they will be able to online to create online communities where people organizations will be able to aggregate the interest collect resources and implement them for example this year we're planning to widen next year planning to promote our tax projects that we uh, presented in the Lithuanian Poland where people could send part of their tax taxes to a certain foundation after that, using the democratic, we'll be able how to. It was a very successful pilot project. Can be seen in various countries and cities where people can decide on their own how uh, to use their own resources. I would like to end by saying that 
made an effort or some expert in this research said that it's impossible to implement certain online projects in the offline space. On the other hand, I've, uh, I think that sometimes, at some point in the future when there is infrastructure for the project and for the processes, they'll be able to influence seriously on the system as a whole. For example, an, an example with the project Golas or the voice in 2020, when a simple digital solution totally changed the situation that the situation that had been there before. So maybe we should come up with new solutions, not standard solutions, and try using digital instruments to to unite people, bring, bring them together, together, and to give them a possibility to take part in the decision making, and also make it possible for them to influence their own life, even in such difficult conditions. Thank you very much, Andrei, for your commentary. We have another expert, political analyst Artem Scheiben, who would like to comment on the certain parts of the survey and research. On the whole, I asked Artem to be more critical about um, our research because it reflects the main views on Artem. I wanted him to comment on what I present in the first part in our research on the idea that uh, digital narratives can change the political situation and digital tools. So uh, what is the influence of digital tools on today's policy, today's politics and tomorrow's politics? Thank you very much. I would like to Thank Lisa for a wonderful research. I don't have any criticisms, serious critical remarks about, about, about it. In terms of conclusions, I would uh, oppose the, the digital side of the political activism that you proposed. And the main key points that Christopher also mentioned is that the digital project is more active during the crisis of ideas. And uh, a few minutes ago, Andrew said, Andre said, the civil society is not actively using the digital tools enough to involve new people. All this is true, but uh, I think all these thoughts, they move us away from the the real the, and deep issue and problems that uh, today, the digital tools of today. I think the reason is much deeper. It's connected with the unwillingness uh, to get involved with NGOs and political actors particularly compared with 2020. Now the, the crisis of non-involvement of people in digital projects is not the primary reason of this issue, but uh, it is uh, only shows that uh, for a number of reasons, the demand of 2020 is not there. The Belarus society has changed due to the propaganda, the repression, and disappointment and to ignore it to think that the side today wants as much and as many ideas as in 2020 the this community demands involvement from the side of the ngos and we are just not finding the instrument that is there is wrong 
not a single digital solution will be able to change this current status quo. It has much as a lesser and more demand for getting involved in the political activities. Plus, 2020 was the time with commercial sector and others had representatives joining the third sector and democratic process. Now we see the outflow of people from the third sector. And uh, it's uh, it's bad to blame people that uh, they have not come up with enough digital tools to get involve people. Talking more about the research, I would say that I noted for myself that there are three formats of uh, digital political civil activism, three goals, three levels at which it can exist. It's first is spread information, some campaigning, second the mobilization of for people. And we can argue whether this is part of digital activity or not, like direct action. Sabotage, I, we're here talking about some uh, cyber patterns. This is a unique path for Belarus, but I think it testifies to a level of political mobilization. But the first two, they're not unique as such for Belarus. They're not unique for authoritarian countries. They're not unique for the politics as a field in the sense that that hundred percent of our life is digitalized. We listen to music, uh, watch films, order food through digital platforms and politicians and civil societies here are services. They're following people where people are now, where people exist a major part of their time while more asleep. In this sense, is digital activism something uh, separate as a phenomenon or is it a state of evolution of the political activism is a big question and in this sense the Belarusian case has nothing new or conceptually new or significant and worth mentioning this is an open question for me for us the difference between online and offline digital activity is in the proportion. Today's Belarus, 99% is online activity and 1% are offline active. We talk about democratic camp. I mean, the people who are still in Belarus, printing leaflets and blowing up the railways. 99% of people are using the digital forms of political and civil participation among the diaspora the amount of offline activity is much wider because there are diplomatic channels and so on. there are certain meetings certain actions in the streets and there are certain forms of offline politics in 2020 the relation the proportion was different. The offline component was much bigger. And in future, I think we'll see that the digital component of civil activity will be proportionally less than what we see today, despite the new tools that will appear, because everybody said about, spoke about this. They said that the changes are, major changes are happening offline the regime is changed offline, not online. Sooner or later, digital activism, as it should, will be a, an add-on to the online activism. 
moving directly to the questions that Alice asked me. Bef uh, those before the presentation about the pluses and risks and potential disadvantages of the pro-democratic projects. I can say that the absence of the absence of offline policy, at least the legal one, digital dimension and so on, is if this is a collective phenomenon, because without it there will there will be there would be no policy at all. The teams of the voice of New Belarus and honest people will not be spread in leaflets. They would rather leave the activism or they're just collecting money for the to help the victims of the repression that moved to Poland and Lithuania. In this sense, the digital dimension of activism allows to have a digital additional value at every level of the political participation. The concrete advantages here, as mentioned many times, are to easier reach the, and the person, more ways of, uh, of keeping an anonymity. It is possible through keeping the digital hygiene and it's much difficult for authorities to fight just like this. It's uh, technically more difficult to shoot protesters in the street. It requires modern technologies and the authorities are making an effort to cope with it. Plus for the diaspora and their activism, for our today's format of activism, there are many more opportunities to keep a connection with protesters inside the country than it was, let's say, for Lenin 100 years ago. Even though the this nucleus of political protesters is getting smaller every every year. Another plus, non-trivial plus, that may sound cynical, but I believe it's also very important, thanks to the this palette and vividness of digital and other digitalized activities and uh, civil structures, uh, teams remain, people get remain engaged. Otherwise, they would leave the civil activism to drive an Uber or IT sector. This way, the, there's a chance that they get involved when the changes become possible inside the country. So the effect of digital or semi-digital platforms that we have now, maybe it's not that visible, but it keeps people together in such movements. And this is a very important. In our situation, if we talk about risks and minuses, I don't see many of those, uh, apart from the clear cut risks of security and safety. Uh, that we saw in the, with the black book of Belarus, when the personal data of Belarusians was leaked. The only thing I want to say in conclusion is that when there is more dynamic situation in the offline space, there could be a risk of this energy of, of political actors will dissipate because people got used to existing in online space. And we see some actors of change, they hyperbolize the effects of the digital solutions and they disregard the offline activities without which the regime will not change. To simplify this thought, we can say that instead of preparing loudspeakers and for protest, protest will be collecting millions of clicks to support the removal of Natalia Kachana. I think this is one of the long-term risks as far as the digital political participation is concerned. 
unfortunately in 2020 i did see some instances of this even uh, our beloved leaders of protest thought for a while that it is enough to show people that the election was stolen from it from people in 2020 that the victory will come it's and was seen in August, September, and October that people were hoping for the digital mechanisms of mobilization of society, ignoring the offline elements. I just hope that 2020 taught us all, among other things, that the solution, the more basic traditional political tasks this should not be replaced by the focus on digital add-on. I stop here. Thank you very much. Artem, thank you very much for your commentary. And the speakers, please let me know if we have five to ten more minutes. Yes, we do. Thank you. Dear participants, if you have any remarks or comments, please use this opportunity to ask them. We did have questions in the chat, but I saw that Lisa was trying to answer them. I don't think it was a waste of time to read them out, but I'll read the question that I, I think is very important and was left by the journalist during the registration. I think it touches upon all the speakers and concerns all the speakers. I'd be happy if all of you, or at least some of you, comment on it. What do you think? How effective for Belarusian authorities is to recognize democratic, pro democratic platforms like um, The Voice and the New Belarus and others uh, to recognize them as extremist? Is it effective for the regime? What do you think? Lisa, I'll be brief for them or to is effective. Why not? Giving them the status of being extremist, there's a legal foundation to detain the person, to scare the authors of the initiatives, and to bring down the potential influence and activity of such initiatives on the society. So, from the point of view of autocratic guide on how to suppress the society, that is quite effective. Thank you, Lisa. Andrei, please. I would like to add, it's a simple way to apply repression on the people inside the country, because the fact of recognition or recognition and the fact of breeding such an extremist or called extremist resource media can be the foundation for launching a criminal case against the person particularly if a person decided to finance this initiative it's important to say here that the concept of extremism uh, has been uh, invented in the countries of Belarus, Russia, and Central Asian countries, because the legal sphere doesn't have this notion. There's a violent extremism and uh, terrorism, and this kind of extremis extremism was invented to fight the people to, uh, to become a simple instrument for oppression. We have another question in the, ch in the chat. It is about the agenda of the NGOs. Interest, it's interesting that despite all this, there's a certain interest towards the courses on the human rights protection and others, both online and offline. Maybe some of the experts could comment on this. Why is it happening? 
I can try. I think if your commentary was about some of my skeptical remarks about the public organizations and massive uh, mobilization, I think there's no difference here. We're just talking about different scales, the interest towards civil actors and other things. I talked about, I spoke about hundreds of thousands of, of people. I uh, said that so many people don't have attend the courses on human rights protection. But the fact that people in such a status quo still have a desire to participate horizontally in the political education or self-education means that at some point in the future, They'll be using this interest towards the histories, those in identity and civil education in the future. For me, it's obvious, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I remember 10 years ago, after the repressions of 2010, there was renaissance of educational courses and initiatives, seminars, workshops, trainings. When people had a thirst for knowledge in the absence of real policy. I think what we have now is the same story that was 10 years ago, but on steroids. Thank you, Martun. Maybe Lesia and Andri have something to add. A small commentary but with an example. I spoke about the tax related pilot projects presented in Poland and Lithuania. The majority of people who participated in that project in the past were not activists. These are new people who only recently moved abroad, who want to have certain influence on what diasporas are doing. Secondly, we had two projects. like Belarusian Library in Lithuania and a portal on Belarusian, on Belarusian history in English in Poland. What I'm saying is that Artyom was a little skeptical while I am an optimist. It helps me in my activities. I think that the technology can now help to create mechanism or instruments or points of concentration, points of activity of people, so that people in Belarus will not become dispirited and the people outside Belarus and will not dissolve in, in the countries they're now living in. This optimism helped by the digital tools, among other things, to support the identity and Belarusian community. The certain unity that shows that people are still interested in what is happening in their country. This is very telling. Several months ago, we had a marathon of solidarity, which helped to collect over half a million euro. It shows that there's, there is interest, people are still active. They're willing to participate in even through donations. Thank you very much, Andre. We have one more question in the chat. Um, 
Возможно, все-таки Ольга Симашко. Возможно, вы хотели бы голосом озвучить свой вопрос. Ольга Симашко, maybe you wanted to ask the question for us to better understand it and to comment on it correctly. I'll read out the question. How to assess the potential of the digital technologies as an alternative of the, the one-stop shop or something during the election? How it, can it be perceived uh, as a political capital? Can it be perceived as a political capital? I would like to answer this question. I think we understood the question very well, but I'll concentrate on detail on the electoral vo vote. I mean, the, uh, we're talking about the tally here and vote count. This, the vote count can be used, can be done digitally and it's the best way to do it. In 2020, we used Golas or the voice app and that used not only chatbots, but also the new AI, neural networks verification mechanism and so on. So the electoral vote count is not particularly popular because it has its downsides, but uh, it, and it, it shows because the, many, the majority of the countries are voting traditionally, but if we don't have access to such uh, solutions. The digital space will be the means where we'll be conducting voting. So there's a potential now. Now it's the only opportunity that we have, and the future it's worth retaining the tradition of going to the booths with certain digital elements of the vote count, for example. Thank you very much, Lisa. Andre, I see. Artem? Uh, I would like to add that it's worth thinking here about the, the Belarusians and Belarusian community while in 2020 at the peak of the mobilization, less than a million people sent their voting papers. The ballot papers. We talk about today's election in Belarus. The attempt to conduct an, an alternative vote count. I don't think it will involve more than several thousands or tens of thousands of people whether it's the data that would help us to notice the difference between the official figures that could be rigged is a big question. But there are some risks, meaning that the demonstration of this participation could be used by the regime, I would say that very few people are using this digital uh, approach. And also the there'll be a certain fear to take part in such activity on the side of the Belarusians. Also, I think we should consider the situation and the status of the civil mobilization. So we need to understand it's not so easy 
to prove that the vote count was rigged. But it's important also to use such instruments for alternative electoral campaigns. Like the, we have only this option to organize elections in the coordinating council. It's only possible to involve people in the list election poll in Lithuania. Particularly as far as the coordinating council is concerned. Thank you very much, Artyom. I'd like, uh, I, uh, like to say that we running out of time. We have no more questions or comments. Colleagues from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation have sent us the link to the updated English version of the research. I think we need to finalize our presentation. I would like to thank all the participants, speakers, Lisa in particular, for the conduct of research um, for detailed and important comments. I would like to also to thank all the participants who asked the questions and commented on the separate parts of this research. Also, the links to the detailed results of research, both in Russian and English, will be sent by us after the presentation to you. You'll receive them in your mailboxes. Colleagues from Friedrich Ebert Foundation reminded me that the video of this meeting will be placed on the YouTube channel of Press Club, pressclub.com. After it's there, we'll send you the link. Colleagues, do you want to say something uh, before we end on this meeting? Christopher, Alice, Andre. Thank you for moderation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for joining us. I would like to thank Andrea and Artyom for your valuable commentary and feedback. Thank you uh, very much, everyone. And let's keep in touch. You'll have all the information in your mailboxes. Thank you. And till next time, goodbye.